What I'm going to say will return to many of the arguments presented in the excellent film you've been shown. I'm going to cover much of the same ground in my presentation. I want to go back to the time when INED was founded and emphasize something simple but important, which is that we need to put ourselves in the mindset of the time and consider population issues but also economic issues which were crucial in the early INED in terms of categories that now seem remote to us. We might feel close to the time of the liberation when so many institutions were founded that continue to structure France today, but the context was still a long way from ours, and that's what I would like to try and recapture now with you. I would like to look at two key figures mentioned in the film, Robert Debré and Alfred Sauvy. One of the reasons the eminent physician Robert de Bré was so influential was that the government of the liberation was a government of national unity, encompassing Gaullists, Christian Democrats and Communists. In addition to his illustrious medical career, during the Résistance, Robert de Bré had forged ties with Gaullists. His son Michel was a close companion of General de Gaulle and the Communists. The important thing to understand here is that for about 20 years between the mid-1930s and the mid-1950s, there was a political consensus in France in favour of pro-natalism, which Debré advocated in a small volume he published with Alfred Sauvy in 1946. There were dissenters, but they were in the minority. In the main, the anti-natalists were liberals who did not think the state should interfere in or subsidise the birth rate. So the political context at the time was quite specific. To help us understand pro-natalism from the perspective of the time, let us look at what people knew in 1945. Here are two charts. The left-hand chart shows population growth in France since 1800, which over a century and a half had risen slowly from 30 million to 40 million, and the birth rate, which was in freefall. You can see a slight uptick here mentioned in the film, which corresponds to the post-war baby boom. But in 1945, people interpreted that increase in the light of what had happened after 1918, i.e. as a small temporary rise in the birth rate. They did not expect the baby boom to last. The other chart is also very important. It is a comparison of population growth in France, in blue, which had almost been flat for 150 years, and population growth in other countries. The red curve is Britain, and the black curve is Germany. But many other European countries showed a similar pattern. France was an exception in Europe. And those are the facts we need to understand the positions of key figures at the time. Pro-natalism emerged in France in the latter half of the 19th century from a militaristic perspective. We should bear in mind that armies were still largely about manpower at the time, and it transmuted in the period between the two world wars. I'm going to talk about two people who embodied pro-natalism. They didn't reconceptualize it, but they did embody it. The first is Adolphe Landry, who can be considered a population economist, a pro-natalist, pro-family advocate, Landry was a politician who held several ministerial portfolios. As Minister of Labour in 1931, he introduced family allowances in France, or, to be more exact, turned an employer's scheme into a law that covered the whole population, including farmers, for the first time. Landry was emblematic of the coming together of pro-natalist population policy, family policy and welfare policy in the interwar period. Those were the three pillars. And Landry passed on that policy approach to his young chief of staff, who was only 25 when he started in 1932, Pierre Larocque. La Roque was arguably the most important senior civil servant and government advisor in France for the development of welfare policy in the 20th century. 
Laroque, Laroque fully implemented the Landry model. Here is an image of his membership card of the Alliance Nationale, which was the pro-natalist lobby at the time. It was the alliance between pro-natalism, family and welfare that was the backdrop to the foundation of INED. I really want to emphasize the family dimension. It is important to remember that INED came into being three weeks after the introduction of social security in France. To give you a visual metaphor, simplifying greatly of course, INED was like a pilot fish swimming along social security. Why? For a reason evoked several times in the film and which is probably the only point we still have in common with the context of 1945 the issue of the independence of research. INED was founded simultaneously with several other French research institutes to serve public policy under the direction of government ministries. At the time, research was applied research and its objective was to serve public policy. The situation we know now developed largely because of the efforts of the researchers at that time, and INED and other research institutes contributed to it. The independence of research dates from the beginning of the Fifth Republic in the late 1950s, with the establishment of a ministry of research. And, as the film mentioned, that independence had to be won and continues to be defended. Our independence as researchers can never be taken for granted. So the inception of INED was linked to the introduction of social security, both directly and indirectly, and it was closely associated with the family. The meaning of security that Larocque gave to social security came from a long tradition dating back to Condorcet, who used the word security in exactly the same way. Security is the assurance given to households that in the event of the father's death, it was the era of the male breadwinner, but essentially in the event of the death of the parent of the parents who provided the family's livelihood, the household would not fall into poverty. That is the sense of security that Larocque applied to social security, stressing that it was family security, not individual security. The film referred to family allowances. That was indeed a vital issue. When the social security system was founded, almost half of its budget, of its spending, went to family allowances. In that respect also, the context was very different from today. That budget allocation also reveals the alliance with welfare policy. Why? Because, unlike now, in 1945, fertility was highly unequal between families. The distribution of births was extremely heterogeneous. At the time, three million children, i.e. minors under the age of 21, were born in families of four or more children, which was almost as many as those born in two children families. At the time, therefore, especially for the working class, the payment of family allowances represented a redistributive policy. That connection with welfare gradually diminished as the fertility rate changed. Another question is, what were the aims of welfare policy in 1945? Welfare policy and social security policy in 1945 had quite different connotations from now. Primarily, they had a strong economic connotation. That explains the importance of the economic dimension during the first 10 years of INED's existence. We are extremely familiar with the economic dimension of welfare policy through a model that is still alive today, namely Keynesianism. 
One of the goals of social security at the time was to encourage consumption, but it was also based on an older model, which developed in the first half of the 20th century and was advocated by the International Labour Organization. Using today's terminology, that model could be described as liberal socialist. It is the idea that welfare policy is inseparable from economic policy, in particular the policy of labour market development. I would like to share two quotes from Alfred Sauvy. If human output were doubled, the optimum population, which was a concept at the time, would be halved. And another quote that will appeal to Catherine Rollet, who has worked on the history of the French health booklet, with the health booklet, health becomes a defined piece of society's capital. The thinking in 1945 was that Social Security should obviously have a redistributive function and a protective function, but that it should also have the function of improving labour productivity. That was an absolutely essential aim that, in the case of France, had its origins in the First World War. France emerged from the war with a sense that the mass casualties had compounded the low birth rate and that the insufficient numbers of young people, especially of able-bodied young men, had to be compensated by optimizing the allocation of the population to education and the labor market. This paradigm, which I could call selectivist, guided French public policy between the end of the First World War and the late 1950s. Ined supported the selectivist paradigm. One of the ways it supported it was through the surveys to which Catherine Bonvalet referred earlier, the school surveys that Ined pioneered in the 1950s. At the time, educational justice and efficiency were not about combating social inequality. Their aim was to ensure that good pupils, or gifted pupils as they were still called at the time, would be properly selected by the school system and would pursue their education. Social class inequality was not an issue per se. There was little concern that working class children, particularly rural children, were practically excluded from secondary education. What mattered was that children of manual workers and farmers who did well at school could continue their education. That is what was considered efficient and just. As you can see, we are in a radically different society today. In conclusion, I would like to recall three elements that formed the backdrop to the foundation of INEP. Firstly, ideas about the population were still very biological in the 1950s, when genetics strongly influenced the debate about whether behaviour was innate or acquired. Population issues were largely approached from that biological perspective. Secondly, there was the organic link with protecting the health and welfare of the population. And thirdly, there was the utilitarian view that economic growth was the best welfare policy. There were several interesting points in the short film that I showed you. One important thing that you saw was the extreme poverty, and not only of old people at the time. We need to remember that at the start of the post-war boom, which we call les trente glorieuses, although the term is now debated by historians because of the environmental damage that was done during the period, at that time, France was a very poor country by today's standards. As for the consequences, I'll be brief because the presentations that come next will take up these themes. INED was one of the main gateways through which survey research came to France. Survey research, which is based on empirical data, which may be quantitative or not, is a tradition that is still very much alive at INED. One very important development, which occurred quietly in the 1950s, was that assumptions that had been very biological, very genetic, gave way to empirical evidence of social determination. Regarding the school surveys, I'm looking at Alain Girard's comments here, 
Initially, Girard did not think that social determination was independent from other factors, but he came to realize that, regardless of the phenomena he studied, social determination was the most important factor in educational success, a result that would be only fully accepted a decade later. And one last factor which relates to contraception and abortion was Ined's interest, and specifically Alfred Sauvy's interest, in public opinion, which would gradually encourage policymakers to take the population's new aspirations into account. Thank you.